Let's take a look at using CSS Grid uh, instead of Flexbox to do some layout in our New York Times bestseller project. So we want to do a similar idea where we had the, the home page with the three book covers displayed. Let's try to do it in CSS Grid and see the difference. So I'm going to start off with our New York Times project. I'm going to remix it. And what we're going to do is CSS Grid follows the same design patterns as Flexbox in that you have to have a container and there's children of those containers. But with Grid, you're able to control not only the horizontal, the way it behaves, but also the vertical of the grid. And so that makes it a lot more powerful and a little bit more complicated to use. Um, but let's take a look at some. So if we want to do the same layout that we had in the Flexbox where we had three um, book covers on the home page, equally across and um, equally sized, we need to make a container that holds those um, that content. So let's add the content here just to see what it looks like first. I comment this stuff out first, and then I'm going to uh, add in some images with the source of the books, cover two and cover three. So here we have those covers. And so what we need to do is similar to Flexbox, all CSS grids start off with a container, that's the parent, and then there's children inside of the parent. So if we have these um, three divs here inside of this main div, uh, what we would do is, you know, these three div containers inside of the, the main parent, parent container would be the children. And so we have to give these classes to tell which is the parent and which are the children, et cetera. So let's give this class and to enable this to be, it says grid flow, we need to define that class. And so let's make a style element here. And we'll just put this in line here. We're done. We'd probably move it off to its own CSS file or, or into our main CSS file. But for just development purposes, we'll leave it here. So let's make that class. And to all, all you need to do is similar to Flexbox is to, to enable grid for a layout for a parent and children is to set the display type to grid. And so that will turn this container into grid and its children will automatically follow the grid CSS layout rules. So let's move these images inside of these div children. And we don't see much difference yet, but what we need to do is with the grid is define uh, how we want it to be laid out. So basically we have to kind of define the, the format of the grid itself and how many columns and rows that it's going to have. So to do that, we need to tell it, tell it how many columns first. So we'll say grid template property and say columns and in here you define the number of columns just repeated separated by space with the unit of measurement that you wanted to use so say you wanted a bunch of columns that were 50 pixels long uh wide i'm sorry then you'd have 50 50 50 right and so then you'd have three columns each 50 pixels wide and so you can see it did that here um there's a lot left over so it kind of broke it but uh that's it's, it's already laying it out in a grid system here um, pixels are bad, right? Percent signs are better. You could say 33%, 33%, 33%. What's even better than these is that what grid introduces is this uh, fractional unit called R. Um, and so these fractional remainder units basically just represent the space available within the available space of the page. So whatever container that it is. So it would equally divide it into three equal parts with these with this unit FR. And so we can see that here, however big it, can, it needs to be and divided into three. And that basically defines the columns, right? So we have three columns, uh, each of these one fractional uh, uh, sizes for each column. We could also define the row if we wanted to, but in this case, we only have one row. So let's just put grid template and then rows, and we'll set it to auto. So now we have a grid set up. What we need to do is, of course, the content is the problem here. It's all different sizes. And in, in previous lecture where we looked at Flexbox, we solved this issue by making the book cover image the a background of a div, and then we can use some special CSS properties of background to change the way that the image flows within that background. And so that's how we solved that problem there. There's, of course, many ways of doing the same thing in CSS. And so another way of doing this is using the object fit property. Um, so let's uh, take a look at doing that. 
So first let's give these classes two. We'll call this just book cover. We're going to give each one of these a class. And then in the book cover class, we want to target this image. So let's do class book cover and then target the images within that class. And so what we can do is there's this object fits property. And so it won't really, we won't see a difference unless we set the size of the image first. So let's just, as an example, let's set the width of the image to something like our pixels. So we can see, and the, since we didn't set the height, it's auto, but we could set the height to the auto just to be, you know, explicit. So what we can see is it doesn't have, you know, it, it makes a size, a specific size. Um, but what we can do is use this object fit um, property. And these have the same or values as that CSS background. So we can say cover. And what this will do is address the image to fill the available uh, container with a cover of the image or try to expand it to so it's fully encompassing however best it can in the in the space provided. So we would have to play around with this to see how well it behaves. Um, let's try increasing this. As the picture gets bigger, it, it's, it can't really do much with a smaller image, but with the picture, as the picture gets bigger, then it would cut down to the right size. So it's maybe not as good as the background solution, but it does normalize things a little bit for images that are larger. Um, we can see in the, if we open up developer tools, we can take a look at the available property values for this cover or for this object fit property. So we have mains, cover, fill, and, and scale down are the kind of the new ones here. So let's see if anything changes objects fit to cover, contain. So let's try contain in it and see if it we see any difference. I wonder if we had a smaller image and we made it much larger, like if we remove these constraints altogether, what it would do. Yeah, it still looks better. You'd have to play around with it a little bit. Let's see how it looks if you have a small window, what happens. Okay, so it gets smaller and then eventually it disappears. You can also play around with using, instead of these kind of fixed sizes, you can play around with using the, the what we call relational units or relative units. So we could say there's a, there's such, there's units called relative um, view height, or so the total height of the viewport or total width of the viewport. So we could say we always want the images to be 25% of the view width. And that's pretty big. So let's say that's, we would always want it to be 5% uh, of the view width. And see what it looks like. I need to put in a semicolon. It was breaking. So that's 5%. Let's say, go back to what I was saying, 25%. <laughs> Uh, let's see what it looks like on a bigger screen. So this kind of performs a little bit. If you wanted to perform like this, you probably want it to behave differently though um, for really responsiveness. But this is a good example of using a little bit more um, relative units as opposed to static ones. So the grid is set up here. We had of it working pretty well. You might need want to center things. So you could see that this is these are not really centered within the their own respective cells. So what you could do is make the image a display into a blocking image or blocking element before images are just in line by, by default. And then you could set the margin of the left and uh, margin of the right to auto. And what this does is that it automatically makes the um, left and right equal. And so then you have a little bit more um, aligned images. All right, so let's take a look at adding another row to this grid. And so there's a number of ways of doing this. Let's do this first way by adding it at the child level. So say we wanted a, a header above this that said some text. Let's add another child here and just say book. And so this div, 
you can see as it's to this layout and so it thinks of it as another child and it's trying to fit it into this pattern right and so this pattern says this book should be that div is just like one of the other divs and so it breaks the three columns into uh, th there's still three columns but now there's two rows right because there's an extra element in that column so it pushes it down to the next row and remember we set the rows are auto so it just will keep adding more rows automatically so at the child level, what we can do is we could give this one a different class and say book a header. And what we could do is take this and define this class at the child level to, um, we could tell it to span a certain number of columns. Just if, in your, if you're like in Excel or Google Sheets and you merge columns together, it will be a column. You can do the same here and say grid column and tell it to start at one and then go to the length, the length of it and merge them into one big column. And so what we did is mer merge this one uh, grid section into spanning three columns by starting at the one. And then, so now this one is one big column across the entire um, page. And so at the child level, if you want to control the alignment within the child, you can do uh, a property called justify self And you can tell it to justify to the center. And so then it would justify it to the center here. And of course, you know, you can play around with this. So in this case, we're, we're just keeping within the grid template layout that we set up, but at the individual level, we're telling you like, hey, this one element of the grid is actually going to span across all of them. So we're breaking the grid into, for just for adding this header. And then if we wanted to add more images, it would just kind of fall into the one. We introduced a little bit of vertical there, and we've been able to control kind of two different styles uh, with this uh, layout. So let's do a little bit more complicated layout because being able to control the horizontal and the vertical is, is really powerful. On our search result page, just head over to the search. We have some, some output here. And so let's design a little, a little layout for this information here. Um, and we can take a look at what that might look like by looking at something like this, where if we sketch out what we might want to see, we'll have each one of these, um, search results represented in maybe a layout like this, where we have uh, an image book cover on the left-hand side, and then maybe the title at the top, and then some description, like the description of the book in the middle. And then we could put the rank of the book on the New York Times bestseller list, like, so say it's rank five or whatever, we could put it over there. So if we think about this in terms of what it would look like in a grid, and this is actually three columns again, but also two rows, because we have that title is part of the top row. So if we wanted to split this up into pieces of that, we could say, okay, the first two columns there of the first and second row are the title or the cover image. The bottom right is the rank. Middle bottom is the description, and the, the top uh, two last columns are the title. So if we do it this way, you can see that it's a grid, but we need to merge not only the vertical columns for the first one for the cover, but also the I'm sorry, we need to merge the vertical rows between the book cover image. We also need to merge the the columns on the title um, text. So we needed to be able to define this layout and so that the display knows how it can represent this correctly. So to do this, we can we have to follow the same pattern as we did before. So let's get this page ready to do that. We can go in and um, let's just comment. We'll just build it in a template first and then we'll apply this data, the real data to it for after we're done. So let's go in here and take the parent container. So let's we'll call that a div and we'll give it a class of search results. And then inside of here, we're going to have a search result uh, children. So each one of these grid containers, just for clarity, let's make each one of these like one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So we're going to have six divs here just to get started to see it. So let's do that.
so let's define a style element again you you want to move this into its own a style sheet later once you're done developing it but let's say that the search results is going to be one of these uh, display grid layouts and we need to define how we want the uh, grid columns and rows to be and so uh, this is similar to what we just did but we just need to say okay we want the grid templates uh, columns to be let's just start off with uh, the same three columns and then we're also going to define the template uh, rows though and we'll say we need two rows right and so just by doing that if we've broken it into columns two columns of th two rows of three columns right one two three four five six so we actually know that column one and four need to be merged, or rows one and four, or cells one and four need to be merged together to form the book cover, and two and three need to be merged together to form the title. And so what we can do at the parent level to tell the system how these should behave is with a property called grid template areas. And so this is one way of doing it, and it's a pretty unique approach to doing layout in CSS because you're visualizing how you want it to lay out using a textual descriptions for each area. Say we know that this first cell is going to be the cover. Let's call it the cover. And these have to be in quotes, cover. Then put a space. And then this is going to be the title. So we'll put title. And then we know cell three is going to be the title as well. So that's the first row. And then the second row, we know that the four is going to be a cover again. Then it's going to be the description of the book and then six is going to be the rank. So we've broken this up here and we visually laid it out using these keywords. And these keywords are just variables that you define however you want to call them. So once we have overall layout, we need to assign, we got to say, hey, this piece, this div is this piece of the layout. And so to do that, we need to make some classes. So we could say, let's call this the, the area cover. And so with this class, we'll say, uh, there's a property called grid layout, uh, sorry, grid area, and then the name that matches one of these in the parent layout. So we'll call this cover. And so now let's give it a color to background of blue. So now this, we need to say this cover area matches this cover in the layout. And then we just have to point it to which divs are belong to that one. So it's going to be this one, one, and six, just as our example. And so you see the one disappeared because it merged these two together. And so we'll clean this up later, but let's just leave them there just to illustrate what we're doing. So let's do the title. Make it red and apply those to two and three. And then uh, four and five will be the uh, description. And so we just need to assign those. Oops, I gotta call this rank, that title. All right, so we built this layout here and you can see it looks pretty correct, right? So the six and a merge with the one and the three and the two merge. So since these cells are merged, we don't really need them anymore. We can get rid of the duplicate divs because the, the layout knows what it's doing and it will just, um, position these and expand them in the correct way. So now we have the layout for each search result defined. And so we define that in this kind of very interesting way of doing this visual approach and the textual approach to the areas and then defining each area and what div maps to it. So let's take this and apply it to our actual data. So we'll comment this out and we'll insert our template that will repeat for each row search result and we'll just slot in the data and see what it looks like here's the title and then the image the cover we'll just add that as a image with a source and then the description here And then the uh, rank we have available. 
All right, so when you run this, we should see some results. Of course, the, the image is way too big, so it breaks everything. So we could probably make this pretty static sized. So let's set the cover. Let's target the images in the cover to a, a limited size. We'll set it to, um, you know, we'll set it the height to a max of um, 150 pixels or something like that. All right, so we have that working there. And then we have, so you can see this is like equally divided. This is pretty, uh, it's taking up a lot of more room than it actually needs to. So what we could do is we could reduce these fractional values down to uh, smaller values. So it takes up less space. So it looks like the image doesn't really need to be as big as it is. So we can maybe reduce that to half the size. So then the left column would be, and then we could say, um, maybe the rank doesn't really need to be that big because the rank is, we could even make that much smaller. We could say that's like a quarter of a fractional unit. So that's much smaller. And then we could say this is a pretty good size. Uh, so what we could do is also do that with the rows too, because the title, this is obviously much more content than the title is going to be. So let's make the title smaller than the other row. So now we're really playing around and, and being able to, to structure this correctly. Let's make the images center. So we'll use that same trick we did in the previous Spice Cell to center. So now it's centered. And then we could play around with everything else, you know, make the rank number bigger, make it 3D, do whatever you want, right? Uh, you could probably want to do the same thing. So you'd have to play around with this and get it working. But you can already see this is a, a kind of a, a pretty a, a good way of doing more complicated layouts with very little CSS, honestly. It's only a few lines of CSS that kind of devise, devises this much more complicated layout. So this is a good kind of place to stop with this one. CSS Grid is a little bit more complicated as we looked at, but it gives us a lot more flexibility, especially in the vertical. So it's a super useful tool. And of course, there's a lot of properties to take a look at for the CSS grid implementation, both at the um, the um, parent level, the container level, and the item children level. So there's a whole number of properties to get familiar with that can kind of um, uh, you know, control things at a granular level and uh, kind of to make your life easier to get uh, used, what used to. So this um, page shows a bunch of those I'll link off to and also the Microsoft Developers Network, of course, has a nice uh, write-up of all the different properties as well. And of course, in addition to the properties that we've covered so far, there's uh, a lot of other grid-related properties to get familiar with. Uh, there's a couple of good sites that link uh, or that describe the different components, uh, properties from the children to the container um, to get familiar with. Another very useful, a um, little bit more advanced CSS uh, is the ability to use CSS variables. And so variables allow you to define values um, for properties that take uh, unit values and reuse those values as a variable instead of having to type them over and over again in different places. So the most common way of applying this technique is in your style sheet, you would use a pseudo uh, element called root. And so this is basically just a kind of a elementless uh, um, property or element um, uh, element so it's not like you know the body it's not anything it's just the the root so it's applying these styles to everything on the page um, but it's a pseudo class so it probably wouldn't affect anything but inside of this this root pseudo class you can define some variables that uh, you can use later wherever in the in the in within the CSS rules that are the first that follow it so for example um, if you wanted to define, like, uh, say that this books text is always going to be, is you know, we consider this a call to action text color, and so this should always be a certain color or something like that. What you could do is define a variable, and variables always start with two dashes, 
and then you give it whatever you want to call it. So it's probably good practice to say like this is going to be a color, and then you could say call to action uh, text color or something like that called action text, and then you give it a value, and you know you could make this whatever color you want, but let's just give it a shorthand red for now. And so now we define this variable to equal this value. And so what we could do is wherever we wanted to reference this this variable is we go into our code. So that was on here on the um, we put that here in this book header text. We could say uh, color, and then to reference any of the variables you defined, you say var and then parentheses and then put the variable name. And so then this calls back to the where it was defined and pulls the value and replaces this with the value internally. So you can see it turned red because that's the color that we picked. So this uh, could be done you know, for anything uh, that really uh, can be a value. Um, it makes more sense for certain things like colors and uh, you know, fonts and stuff like that, sizes perhaps. But what's nice about this is that if you wanted to perhaps, uh, you know, have a certain style guide for your site uh, or for a larger project you can define all those things in one place and then if you wanted to come back later and change them then you could just change it in one place without having to change it in you know the you know 100 different places that you define that that color so it's a good practice to kind of make uh, you know changing things a lot easier and to kind of provide a little bit more easily readable css rules it's also good to be able to do this if you wanted to have different themes on your site based on different css properties so you can imagine if you have like a night mode or something like that that could just be a separate root definition with different values and so depending on like a media query you could potentially just load in different variable values for whatever, you know, if it's if the web page is being viewed at night. So you could have different themes um, with, with just changing the variables without having to change the actual, you know, all the different places it's mentioned in inside the CSS. So it's just a good thing to be, be aware of. Um, if it, you're doing a larger project, it probably makes sense, or if you have a much kind of much more defined uh, style guide that you want to stick to and kind of get everything up a front, it's also a good way of doing it. Um, so it's super useful just to be aware of uh, and be able to implement it when it makes sense. And, and these all kind of control nuances of how the grid's set up and how the items behave within that grid. So I'll link off to this and also a Mozilla Developer Network, of course, has a nice uh, glossary of the different properties as well.